as electricity markets by Patrick Blanc. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so I'm Patrick Brown, a postdoc here at the MIT Energy Initiative. And I'll be discussing work we've been doing um, on how we can combine spatially and temporally synchronized electricity prices, weather data, and emission rates across the U.S. grid to understand the changing value of solar um, across the U.S. So one thing I, I won't do is try to guess at what solar might cost in the future, because if I did, I would probably be wrong. Um, so if you compare the Energy Information Administration's projections for what solar would cost in the future, shown in the, the green curve on the top, with the costs that have actually been observed in the blue and the red curves, we find that based on this projection they made in 2009, their guess for what solar would cost in 2030 was actually beaten um, just a couple years later in about 2011 and 2012. So solar is getting much cheaper um, than had, had, been, had been expected. The, um, the, the bad side of this is that so, while solar might be cheaper than you expect in the future, um, it also might be worth less. Um, so this has been demonstrated in the California system um, this is showing the change in the daily electricity price profile um, as over a time period where solar went from around 2% of yearly energy, energy generation to about 15%. And we see that in 2012, when solar um, was a relatively small part of the system, electricity prices peaked in the, in the middle of the day, and so solar producers enjoyed high prices for the energy they were selling, whereas um, just in 2017, the middle of the day is now the lowest um, price time of, time of the day, and so the, the value that solar producers are getting for each megawatt hour is, is declining as that solar penetration increases. At the same time, if we look at emission rates um, across, the, across the U.S. grid, this is showing um, uh, CO2 and then various um, particulate matter producing um, air species um, across different regions over the U.S. over the past uh, 15 years or so. We see that these emission rates for these uh, particulate matter um, sources are also declining, um, basically as uh, more emissions control technologies are installed at coal plants across the U.S. Um, so this is, is great news um, for everyone, um, but if you're a solar producer, it means that the, the marginal environmental benefit or, or social benefit that you provide with your solar is going down as the, as the grid cleans up. And so both for the economic value and for the social benefit, the message here is that grid parity is a, is a moving target, um, that as more solar comes online, the next unit of solar has to get cheaper and cheaper in order to provide the, the same benefits. And so the, the question um, as, a result, as a result of this is, what does this mean for the value of solar today across the U.S.? Um, and in terms of that, what is the cost target that solar uh, would need to meet in order to, to break even? Um, and then um, also, how can we change the design of a solar system to optimize not just for energy production, but for the value of the energy produced in terms of the emissions offset or in terms of the, the market value? So to address these questions, we put together a, a large um, empirical data set um, of electricity prices and grid data for six major electricity markets across the U.S. Um, so I'll be discussing these various markets that range from um, CAISO in California, ERCOT in Texas, MISO in the Midwest, and then PJM, NISO, and ISO New England in the, in the Northeast. And so we do this analysis at the level of locational marginal pricing. So we have around 10,000 pricing nodes uh, spread across these different ISOs. And so for each node, we have the locational marginal price at hourly day ahead and five minute real time resolution. The market clearing capacity price and demand, which we can use to assess the capacity value of solar. Um, emission rates on the grid, and then combine that with a separate data set of, of, of weather data um, at half hourly resolution across the U.S., which we use as inputs to a, um, a solar production model. So here we're modeling utility scale solar generators using single axis tracking, um, basically representative of what you're seeing installed today um, at large scale across the, across the system, and combine those to understand the marginal um, value of essentially a price-taking um, solar unit. Um, so just multiplying the hourly production times the hourly value to understand um, the, the yearly value of that generator. So my talk today, I'll first um, talk about the validation of that PV production model, see how well we match up with actual um, utility scale plants, discuss um, the three major components of the value, the energy value, capacity value, and then the social benefits from emissions offsets, um, discuss what that means for the break-even cost of solar, and then if there's time at the end, um, discuss how we can shape the output of, of PV generators um, throughout the day to provide the highest um, electricity market value. So to start with, since we're simulating utility scale solar generators, we want to know how well can we reproduce the actual reported um, production of, of solar generators. So for that, there's a, a very useful data set, which is the Energy Information Administration's Form 860 um, data, which has locational and um, system design data 
for utility scale solar plants um, across the US, including their, their location, their module technology, tilt angle, and tracking um, for around 1,000 plants as of 2016. Um, can combine that with the uh, EIA Form 923 data, which is monthly generation from each of these plants, um, and basically um, compare that to our um, monthly aggregated data to see how well we reproduce this uh, utility scale data. So if we stack them all together, just, this is just kind of a, a rough look at the data. We see we um, fairly uh, closely reproduce the, the um, historical generation for the year um, 2016. We can get a bit more uh, quantitative by looking at two different error metrics. The same as in the last talk, the relative mean bias error, showing how far positive or negative we are off from the observed value, and then the relative root mean squared error. And here I'm uh, breaking down these errors by, by month, and then also by um, the size of the plant. So the all plants are, co are collected in the blue line, and then plants greater than 10 megawatts are the dashed red lines. And so we see that in general we have a, a better um, uh, correlation with the observed data in summer than in winter. Some of this could come from the fact that we're not accounting for snow cover on modules, which could bias the results in the winter. Um, we also have a, a better agreement with these larger plants, the 10 megawatt plants um, and greater, compared to all plants, which you might expect just if you're a larger plant, you kind of have a larger area and there's less spurious shading from trees and buildings and things. Um, and overall about a, um, around a 5% uh, uh, relative mean bias error. We can separate this also in terms of fixed uh, plants or, or tracking plants. Um, so there's basically fewer parameters that you need to um, assume for fixed plants. You don't need to assume the maximum tracking angle or the ground coverage ratio. So we see a bit better, um, so in terms of a bit smaller uh, relative mean bias error and RMSE error um, for fixed plants compared to tracking plants. Um, but overall, the errors again are around, around 5 to 10 percent, which is actually about the same as the input satellite data which we use to, um, to assess the solar production. So we shouldn't really expect to get better than that. Um, and so that gives us pretty good confidence in translating that, um, that incoming meteorological data into the actual solar, solar production. So this is at the monthly level, which is relevant for the absolute level of the solar generation. Um, we also want to know how well we're reproducing the observed generation at the hourly and at the daily level, um, both because um, electricity prices can spike um, for, for small hourly increments, and so it's important to know if, if you're available during those, during those high price spike times. And also, as we saw in California, the, the electricity price can be very correlated with, with solar generation, so we want to know how well we're reproducing at this finer time resolution. So for that, we use um, empirical data from um, a single solar plant, a one megawatt array at the site of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, and so we can compare that data for 2016 in blue with the um, simulated data in orange, and this is showing the hourly data over the full year. And we see we again get a, a pretty close match, so there are some days where um, there's intermittent clouds in the day, we reproduce those hourly variations. Um, and for the most part are, are pretty closely matched, um, except again in the winter where we're over, over predicting um, generation, which you might expect this being a, a fixed tilt array with a relatively uh, low tilt, and so it has a lot of snow accumulation, which we don't account for. But overall, we're reproducing both the kind of monthly level and then the daily variation, which are the, the two pieces that we're, that we're concerned with. And so if we um, start with the energy value, here we're combining the hourly production at each of these sites with the hourly electricity prices um, here for, for 2016 across the US. And there are a couple interesting uh, pieces you can notice. Um, the first is that the sunniest locations um, in, in the Southwest aren't, aren't necessarily the best locations to be installing solar for energy value. Um, and in particular, uh, there are a couple of congested regions across the East Coast um, where the value of solar can be up to twice as much um, as it is in other areas across the grid. And, and this mostly results not, not because these places are much sunnier than their surroundings, but because they are highly congested areas of the grid, and so electricity prices are higher um, in those locations. Um, we can do this for um, each of the years in our data set, running back to 2010. And so we also see there's um, a pretty significant um, yearly um, or temporal variability um, in that data. And again, this is not because it's, get, it's that much sunnier or cloudier in a given year, um, but because the electricity prices are changing a lot and mostly tracking um, variation in the price of the price of natural gas. So 2014 in, in, um, in green was the highest gas price year, and so it's also the year when solar is, is worth the most. So the value of solar on the wholesale market tends to be um, quite closely linked to the, to the price of gas, since gas tends to the marginal price. So this was the, the first component, the energy. Um, the next component is the capacity value. So as was discussed before the break, um, in most of these markets, there's a, a separate um, capacity market to make sure there's sufficient generation capacity to meet demand at um, supply times of constrained supply. 
Um, so ERCOT, I'm not including here because it's an energy only market, but the other ISOs um, have either capacity markets or records of, of bilateral contract prices for capacity, um, which we, we break down across these different markets. And so solar, because it's intermittent, you can't um, count on it always being available to supply that capacity. And so um, we take the capacity price and multiply it by a calculated capacity credit for solar, which represents the probability that it would be um, accessible during, during these peak demand times. And these uh, times are basically um, times of the year when, when the system is, is under stress. And so um, solar would get a capacity credit for being available. Um, so for the ISOs, the ones in red um, have, have certain hours of the day and certain seasons of the year when um, solar's um, output is assessed. And so we basically take the capacity factor of solar during those times, usually around 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, to assess the capacity credit. Um, KISO um, does its own internal calculations in terms of um, how, to, how to set that capacity credit. And so for that, we take the um, solar capacity factor during the top 7% of, of peak net load hours. So load minus existing um, solar and wind generation and what's the uh, capacity factor of solar during those remaining times. And so you see that along with the reduction in energy price, you also get a reduction in capacity credit basically because peak times are now during the morning and evening um, rather than during the middle of the day when solar, solar is generating. So multiplying those together, we get the capacity revenue from solar. Um, you see that on the whole, these are relatively small compared to the energy revenues, which are up around $60 or $70. Um, but again, there are some uh, particularly constrained regions in the mid-Atlantic and on the East Coast um, where due to this, these congestions on the grid, solar also has a higher capacity value on the system. Um, so the final component is the social benefit. Um, and so for this, we use a great data set that's made available by Carnegie Mellon University, um, which has the hourly um, marginal emission rates of these different criteria pollutants, uh, SOx, NOx, and PM2.5, um, across around 22 regions across the US over the past 15 years. And we use that along with a damages model to translate the offset particulate emissions into um, economic benefits associated with those, uh, with those emissions offsets. And so we see, again, as I noted on the, on the first slide, there's a declining value um, for solar in this respect because the grid is cleaning up. But even in, in 2017, we see, in, in particularly in, in the Midwest, a, a still quite high value associated with these emissions offsets, um, almost equivalent to the energy value on its own uh, because these regions still have a lot, of, a lot of coal and a lot of particulate emissions. The final piece is the CO2. Um, and so in this case, we just directly quantify the CO2 emissions offset in terms of tons per kilowatt of solar per year. And then later, we'll apply a, a uniform carbon price across the different ISOs to assess the, the value of, of, of solar for emissions mitigation. And overall, the CO2 benefits have been more, more constant um, because the marginal generator has still mostly been either coal or gas over this time period. So we have these three value components, and now we want to know how do these compare to the observed um, declining cost of solar, and, and how does solar stack up in terms of a break-even cost? So for that, we have the reported system costs uh, from NREL over the past ten, uh, eight years. And on the solar side, we then add up these various value components and um, calculate basically the net present value of these benefits over the lifetime of the plant, and then solve for the, the upfront cost that would set that net present value equal to zero. And so we, we have a, a range of basically middle of the road um, financial assumptions, including the required uh, return on, on investment. And if you're only including the energy values, which are shown here, we find that um, across most of these ISOs, given the 2017 um, electricity price data, solar would need to reach about 50 cents per watt in order to break even just on wholesale revenues on the, on the market alone. If we add in the capacity revenue, um, in most places it's a relatively small benefit, but in the, in the mid-Atlantic region, this adds um, a relatively sizable um, amount to the, uh, to the, to the break-even cost. We get a large benefit if we start to factor in the, the social benefits associated with air pollution emissions reductions. And so now, um, just based on these components of the, the value, um, solar would break even at roughly half of the nodes modeled in, uh, in the mid-Atlantic and in New York based on these market values plus the, the social benefits of air pollution reduction. We can then keep going and add on the, the climate benefits. Here we can model a $50 per ton carbon price, which is what the federal government used to think was the social cost of carbon in the US. Um, and if we do that, then we find that uh, basically through all of Texas and, and the Midwest, um, solar would break even at these, at these recent conditions on the grid. Um, of course, $50 per ton isn't actually enough to, to reach the two degrees Celsius goal set by the Paris Agreement. Um, various estimates put that floor price more at around $200 per ton 
Um, but if we just um, increase from $50 to $100 per ton um, of carbon, which is again not stringent enough to meet the Paris goal, now we find that solar, with these 2017 grid conditions, including the cleaning up of the grid and the reduction in uh, wholesale prices, that solar now breaks even at um, the, the current costs at all of these nodes modeled. Now, of course, we don't actually have a, a carbon price or an accurate price on, on emissions across the U.S. And so if we would in instead compare just to the, to the market revenues, so this is just including the energy and capacity um, over the, the full range of years modeled, um, and then averaging across all years in the, the thicker black line, we can see how solar would, would perform just as a, a, a market um, player, just on the, on, the, on, the, on the energy and capacity markets. Um, so you see that on the, on the whole, solar would need to, to achieve uh, additional cost reductions, but there are um, some locations, um, again, mostly these, these highly congested regions across the East Coast, where um, at today's prices and only on market benefits, um, there, there's a collection of nodes where solar would break even um, just based on these energy and, and capacity values. And so the, the kind of interesting thing here is that you know, it's not, again, the, the sunniest locations where solar can break even, but by harnessing this locational value, by siting solar exactly where you need it and where the grid is already congested, that you can, you can uh, make a return for that, even just on the, the economic and market value alone. Um, so just one, one last idea bef before I stop is that, as I showed, the prices do vary a lot throughout the day. Um, and you actually have some freedom in the way you design a, a solar plant in terms of um, where, what hours of the day you can get the most production. So this is showing uh, fixed, uh, fixed solar arrays, and as you vary the orientation of that array from east to west, you can move your, your hour of peak generation forward or back by about two and a half hours. Um, also, over this, over this time period, we've seen an increasing number of negative prices, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and so at those times, if you're, again, only playing on the market, then you don't want to be sold, selling energy at that time because you would be essentially paying to, to sell your energy. Um, and so that would also mean you shouldn't just be uh, optimizing or maximizing your solar generation in each hour. So the question is, particularly in, in California, where we've seen a large change in the profile of electricity prices, we want to know, is that observed change in price profile enough to change the way you should design a, a solar plant? And so uh, we can look at, again, just for a, a single node um, in California, this is uh, showing um, optimizing for a capacity factor, so showing the tilt of the array along the radial axis and then the orientation um, along the angular axis. Um, and as you might expect, if you're just trying to optimize capacity factor, you get the highest output by uh, pointing south at a couple degrees less than the, than, less than the latitude. If you take the 2010 price profile and instead optimize for revenue, you get a pretty similar um, number, again, mostly pointing south. If we instead do this uh, uh, calculation using 2017 prices, we get a, a quite large difference. We're now the revenue optimizing orientation for your solar plant um, is almost, uh, at this location at least, almost uh, 60 degrees um, west, of, west of south if you're trying to optimize your energy revenues. So that was a single node. If we look at all the nodes across California, um, the capacity factor um, optimizing azimuth is again around 180 degrees. Um, instead, looking at the revenue optimizing um, azimuths over time, we do see this uh, pronounced trend over time where the, on the real-time market on wholesale revenues, the optimal is about 55 degrees west of south and about um, 45 degrees west of south for, for day ahead prices. That's just the optimum in terms of what that actually does for, for revenues. Um, we find that on the real-time market, you would get basically around a 13% um, revenue boost, not by adding any extra production to your system, but just by changing the orientation and the times of day uh, when you're generating. Um, that's if you still constrain the system to be uh, generating at all times. If you instead allow um, generation to be curtailed during times of negative prices, um, you now, for producing less energy, are, are making 20% uh, higher revenues um, just by uh, shaping your output to, to meet those peaks. Um, so I'm mostly out of time. We've also done this for, for tracking arrays, and you basically find that tracking arrays are, are mostly a, a better solution than just uh, changing the orientation of your fixed array because you now um, have more production over the hours, hours of the day. Um, but in conclusion, we do see that the spatial variation in solar revenues can be, can be significant, um, and that just looking at the LCOE or the capacity factor doesn't give you a, a complete picture based on the, the, these temporal values. Um, that based on the values in 2017, the solar breaks even at a large collection of nodes if the social benefits of solar um, uh, production are factored in in terms of emissions offsets. Um, and that as more solar comes online, there's increasing benefit to designing your solar plant to produce the most energy during either the most emissions times or, the, or times with the highest electricity price rather than just optimizing your, your output over the year. And this will become more important as more solar comes online in the future. Um, so with that, thanks for your attention.
So we need a, a long cable from, Cali uh, from Alexander to New England. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, we need a long cable from uh, Alexander to New England. Or, or, from, or, from, or from Spain. Okay, okay. <laughs> so question, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So Hans Howard from the, the Technical University of Vienna. Uh, so the, the, the traction system, uh, when you change the orientation, so, so that usually uh, you need to be a, a price taker because uh, if you are limited in upscaling because then you have uh, always this kind of economic cannibalism uh, in the system. And you are, are you still, let's say, competitive if you also take into account the, the upfront the, uh, the cost, the additional cost of the track system? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, there, at least in the in the U.S., the the cost difference between tracking systems and fixed tilt systems has been coming down over time. To where at least in 2017, tracking systems are around a dollar ten per watt compared to a dollar per watt um, for fixed. And so um, since, since we see that the the at least in California, the revenue benefits from tracking are around 20 or 30 percent, um, then those outweigh the extra cost benefits. Um, there are also, if you're looking at a fixed system, if you go to very high tilt angles, then you start to need more racking to, to deal with higher wind loads. Um, we don't take that into, into account, so looking at the extra racking required for these high tilt systems. Um, but that would be an interesting thing to add in if you're looking specifically at fixed tilt rather than tracking systems. Did you consider how the prices might change if people implemented your recommendations? It's sort of a dynamic problem, right? So right. people point southwest. Yeah, then eventually, yeah, then maybe you don't point east instead. Um, so in this case, we're only doing this price taker model. And the idea here being we, we can track the, the installation of, of solar as well as the prices. And so um, with more data, um, and this is something we're working on as well, we, you can look at in California how sensitive the value of solar is to the amount of solar installed and use that to make projections into the future. But um, rather than, than making assumptions here, we'd like to just, just track it and see what kind of what the system response is telling us. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Okay.